Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last day of 2023. Can you believe it? I'm happy to be with you here today. I'm Amy, your Director of Church Operations. And we have a special guest with us today in Pastor Jeff's absence. We have Dr. Reverend Robert Clardy. Um, Dr. Clardy is a native of California who enjoys her time with her garden, cooking, and with her husband, Daryl. Robin splits her time between Lifespan Ministries, a ministry she founded with her husband, uh, where she is a pastoral counselor, spiritual director, and at New Hope Presbyterian Church, uh, where she's a parish associate. Uh, her heart's desire is to make the love of God known to those, to everyone that she meets, and we're so thankful that she's here with us today. So, welcome to service. Welcome to those online, in person, before we begin, Please stand, look to each other, and give them a warm welcome. i 
prayer for the new year. Dear Lord, whether we're leaving behind a year of joy and blessings or trials and difficulties, we pause to give thanks. We thank you that you are always with us 
every single day of every single year. Please remind us of your presence in the year ahead, even when life is busy. We are so thankful that we serve a God who makes things new and gives us the grace of fresh starts and new beginnings. Be glorified in our lives this year. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to say it's very good to be back with you. Uh, you have a special place in my heart. I'm going to read the scripture first. The scripture comes to us out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 25 through 40, and you can find it in your Pew Bible, uh, 1561. Hear the word of the Lord. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the gentle, Gentiles and for glory. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There also was a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived her life with her husband seven years after 
uh, after, sorry. <laughs> Then uh, as a widow, sorry, uh, as a widow to be an age of 84, she never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and she began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Then, they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of the Lord was upon him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was growing up, I loved watching Cecil B. DeMille films, and I still do. I am sure you can remember them. It is a long list. The Ten Commandments, Cleopatra, King of Kings, Sunset Boulevard, War of the World, Samson and Delilah, and the list goes on. They were known for lavish sets and extravagant costumes. And I'm sure many times the films were over budget. I think that was especially true of Cleopatra. It took much longer and much more money to finish that movie. They were known as epics. Huge storylines with protagonists, with a sense of duty or leadership. And of course, there were love triangles. As I pondered this passage today, I thought, who better to tell this epic story of a nation waiting for Savior? To tell of a nation to be saved from the oppressive hold of the Roman Empire, who had taken their land, who had taken their wealth and their freedom. Who better than Cecil B. DeMille to tell the story? He knew the Bible. He was brought up in a religious home, and every night his parents would read to him one chapter of the Old Testament, one chapter of the New Testament, and a chapter of history. Who better to bring the story of this passage to life? Imagine it on a huge screen. So ponder, how would he tell the story? Who would be the focus or what would be the focus of this story? Now, it wasn't mentioned, but maybe he would focus on Herod, the tyrannical king, highly suspicious, always looking for anyone or anything that would uh, challenge his reign. So Herod, the great king. Cecil B. DeMille might focus on the temple. Herod had built that temple. It was on the Temple Mount, 40 acres covered with brilliant limestone. So as you went up to the temple, it would glisten. Nothing left undone. Cecil B. DeMille and Herod, how they both had epic things in their lives. And yet that temple was the center of Jewish life. That was the very place that people would go to meet with God. It's not like today where we have the Holy Spirit with us. We carry God with us all the time. This nation of people, believers in God, had to go to the temple in a sense of that's where they went. So even though Herod had built the temple, it was a place where the God of Israel rested. Would Cecil B. DeMille focus on this unknown, lowly couple, Mary and Joseph? Maybe he would draw out the, the, the topic line of what brought them there 
that day, that particular day. Mary and Joseph, who were very devout, they were very observant in all the laws. So therefore, 40 days after Mary gave birth to Jesus, as a custom, if it was a male, it would be 40 days. She had to go to the temple for ritual cleaning before she could enter into the temple again. Just a sidebar, if she had had a, a female, a, a baby girl, she would have to wait 80 days, not 40 days. So in essence, she was seen as, as unclean because anything with blood was unclean. And she was there not only for purification, she was there to present her firstborn male, the child who opened her womb. And as, as the law required, you would give your first fruits to God. But there's also a, a sidebar to that, because then you would go and you would give five shekels to the priest and you would have the redemption of the firstborn. That's what it was known as. And you would buy your child back. So, so not only did she present her son to the Lord, she had to buy him back. That's an interesting storyline. How would Cecil B. DeMille draw that out? Or would Cecil B. DeMille look at Simeon and Anna? Would those two people be the focus of this epic story? Two people who have just a few verses dedicated to them in the whole of Scripture. Would we see Cecil B. DeMille draw out the longing of their hearts, their actions? Would it catch his eye as to how they lived their lives? Now, Simeon and Anna were vital to the story of Mary and Joseph. There would be something about why they were going every day waiting to meet Jesus. Would Cecil B. DeMille see their, their meeting with Jesus as something worthy of an epic? Think of this. Pause for a moment. 40 acres of a temple. There are worshipers. There's all this action going on, just the temple itself. And this lowly couple walks in with this 40-day year, 40-day old baby boy. There was nothing that would make them stand out. They were common people. We we know from scripture they didn't have the the offering that would make them look like they were people of worth, they had to offer two pigeons. And in comes this story, Simeon and Anna. We don't have much of the story, the backstories of these people, and a little bit more than, than Simeon. What would Cecil B. DeMille do to fill in the blanks? Places where the scripture do not speak. If he started with the story of Simeon, Simeon who was prompted by the Holy Spirit came into this huge space of worship, all the people bustling around, and, she, and he knew. Because the Spirit had sent him, he knew that this babe was Jesus. We don't know if he was a rabbi, if he was maybe a, a citizen of worth. Was he a common person? We do not know that. But there was something in his presence that allowed Mary to give her baby to this unknown man. And Simeon takes this baby in his arms. This man filled with the Holy Spirit 
who the Holy Spirit rested on continually. And we will sing later the song of Simeon. Because I spoke the words, but it was as a song of praise. In the holding of that 40-day-old baby, Simeon's heart was opened. And Simeon's heart said, I can now be released. I can now die in peace. Had Simeon waited 40 years, 50 years, maybe 80, 90 years, praying constantly for this babe? And this babe was in his arms. And his response was praise. And that now he could die in peace because the long-awaited Savior, the one who would redeem this nation, he was holding in his arms. It's hard to conceive of it. He had positioned his life for this one time. And being an observant Jew, somebody who positioned prayer in the center of his life, we don't know what else he did, but he centered his life waiting for this Messiah. And we hear in the scripture just at this moment, because remember, Simeon is, re, is giving words to Mary that are confusing. They're, they fall on her heart in a harsh way because they are harsh words, but yet they are true words. And just at that time, Anna shows up. We are told that she's a prophet She's only the third prophet in the New Testament. We have John the Baptist. We have Jesus and we have Anna. Let that sink in. What would Cecil B. DeMille do with this person, a woman, as a prophet? And she cries out to God. She is, she's righteous and devout. She has a father and a tribe and an age and a marital status. And she remains faithful in the temple day and night. Now, we don't know. Is she a deaconess? Is she a sister of charity? Does she, does she live? There's actual rooms in the temple. Does she live there or nearby? Because all we know is this older woman and would Cecil B. DeMille dress her in black in this sort of flowing robe? Would she have a shawl around her on her head? Would she have long silver hair, gray hair? I imagine her face shone with the presence of God as a prophet. So Simeon takes Jesus into his arms and he takes it in. Now he can be released. Anna takes Jesus in her arms and she starts proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. And she speaks words of consolation. She meets Mary where Mary is. And her words go out. Here is this woman proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. Think about this. She was the very first person in the world to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Remember, John the Baptist isn't old enough yet. And so now we have this woman proclaiming who Jesus is. She's talking about for the Redemption, looking for the redemption of Israel, of Jerusalem. So these two people are key people in the life of Mary and Joseph and in the life of the nation of Israel. Yet there's just a few verses, but Cecil B. DeMille could bring it to life. So Anna is the type of person that Herod would not want to have around. Remember, Herod is suspicious. 
he is very afraid that somebody's going to take over his reign. And so here is this woman, not only a prophet, but she's an evangelist. And she's telling everyone about who Jesus is. That he's the savior, that he's going to be a king, he's going to be a messiah, the hope of Israel, the redeemer of the world. So we might not know, but Herod's position was also considered as king, as savior, as the one who would redeem Israel. Think of what it felt like in that temple. Day after day, year after year, these two people came to the temple waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem, waiting for the consolation, waiting for things to be restored. Think of these, these Jews who had come into this land. The Romans had oppressed them year after year. Yes, they could worship, but they could only worship under certain eyes. Don't get out of line because the Roman government is watching you at every turn. In their hearts as a nation, they longed to have their lands back, to have their freedom back, to have their identity back, to be a people of honor. Remember, they are the chosen people. And they are being put down day after day. The, 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 the feeling in this temple is palpable. It's like a beating heart. Just waiting to explode. And in that, there are different types of groups out there. Some were waiting for the king who would be the king who would come in on a white horse, being the victor. Because that's what would happen. When a, when a king would overcome another nation, that king would come in with a procession of people. Think of Palm Sunday. Think of it if Jesus came in on a white horse because he was the victor. People wanted him to be the one who would restore everything that was lost to overturn the Roman government, to, be a, to do a coup. Yet Anna and Simeon were part of another group called the quiet in the land. They were not looking for violence. They were not looking to overthrow the government. They came in a quiet way. They contemplated, they meditated. They pulled on the scripture to give them hope every single day. Now imagine waiting year after year. How many of you have prayed for something year after year after year? And you're still waiting. Anna and Simeon knew this, and they took that waiting in an active way, going to the temple. Who knows what people thought of these people, Anna and Simeon. And in their waiting, they built up hope because they knew what they were waiting for. They knew who they were waiting for. They knew who they trusted in. They were active in their waiting. They weren't passive. They weren't biding their time, killing time, marking time. They weren't just holding on, letting the routines of life distract them. They weren't gritting their teeth. This is Anna and Simeon. Their lives are epic even though it's quiet. Do you know people around you whose lives are epic but yet they're quiet? They don't have to be up front, but their faith is rock solid. So these two people invite us as we go, we turn the, the calendar page, whether it's a, on your phone, on your computer, on your laptop. I do paper and my phone because I 
can double book. Turn the page. How might Anna and Simeon help you turn the page and walk into 2024? What of their lives tells you who and how you want to be? Anytime there's a new day, a new week, a new month, a new year, and especially a new year, we all talk about resolutions. I resolve to do this. It's a time to start over afresh. I heard a line a couple weeks ago, and the question that came out to us was, what, what is your favorite day of the week? And he shocked us. He said Monday, because he said Monday is full of possibilities. Friday, the week is over, and you look back, but Monday, Monday is a day of possibilities. So people, tomorrow is a day of possibilities. What will Anna and Simeon speak to you? How will they tell you how to wait when you long for something, when you long for health for yourself or somebody else? when you long for peace in your family, maybe between church members, when you long for political parties to be at peace and work together, for a nation to come together to be the people of God. How long are we waiting for the peace in Ukraine after all this time? thinking that it would come to an end, and yet two years later. And now we wait for the peace of Israel. It is very hard to preach out of the Gospels when it's actually happening today. It's happening today. So people of First Press Fullerton, how will you take the stance of Simeon, and Anna into your new year. What will you resolve to do? What are you looking for? What are you watching for? How are you waiting? How are you praying? How will you position yourself this year to have the Holy Spirit be upon you? To have you do what God has called you to do in 2024. Amen. So this morning we have an opportunity, and Robin set up, you set it up so well. How do we resolve to live like Simeon and Anna this year? And how do we want the Holy Spirit? How do we want God to work in our lives this year? And so we've got a few minutes, and so I'd like to, for you to gather in groups of two or three or four and ask each other this question that's going to be up on the screen here. Where in your life would you like to see God working in the new year? So go ahead and meet some new people. We all got name tags this morning. So turn to your neighbors and see what they have to say.
What a wonderful time to hear from those people that you have been at church with for a, a small time or a large time. And to hear people's hearts cry. And whether it's for something close at hand, something for our nation or for the world, that we carry that. You are the temple of God. We are the temple of God. And you as a congregation have a palpable heart. You have things that God has put in you as a church, as a community, as a congregation. And so your prayers matter for each other and for your community and the prayers that go globally. So let me, let me close this time in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we do come before your throne of grace. God, I thank you that people have opened their hearts to one another, which means they've opened their hearts to you. And God, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would bring life, you would bring wings to every desire to seek you, to seek good in the land to dedicate ourselves to be who you've called us to be, to do what you've called us to do, and to build hope within our hearts and within our congregation. We ask all of this in your precious and mighty name. Amen. Now is a time for an offering. God has poured out so much upon us as the people of God. God has filled us to overflowing. And as Mary and Joseph took Jesus as the firstborn to God, we give our tithes to God. We give that as an overflow of what God has given to you. And Jeff hasn't asked me to do this, yet this is the end of the year. I don't know how the finances are in this church, but I do know that every church wants to make a budget not to have dollars on their spreadsheets, but to fulfill the, the work God has called you to do as the people of God. So give out of the overflow of what God has given to you. Can I have the ushers come forward? And let us join our hearts together as we pray over the offering. God of abundance, God who has a thousand cattle on the hill, God who honors just the, the, the one might or a bag of gold, we give from our overflow because our hearts are overflowed with love. So we give back to you. Bless this offering to do your work. We ask this in your mighty son's name, Jesus. Amen.
let's stand for our closing worship. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus is born. before we close for the day. Uh, first announcement I have for you is tomorrow is January 1st, so your church office and campus will be closed. We will resume normal office hours on Tuesday. Um, also, our adult ministries wanted me to remind you that impact groups are occurring now. Um, all are welcome, new uh, friends. Uh, we have a sign up, I believe, table out on the patio. Um, and if you're interested in joining a group, uh, there's a flyer out there also that lists those dates and times that those groups meet. Um, you're very encouraged to join a group, um, or if you're interested, to go and talk to our adult ministries team that will be out on the patio. And I know many of you have been asking, so we would like to let you know that we are holding two congregational meetings this January. January 14th, after the uplift service, we will be presenting the approval for the sale of our Casablanca property. And then on January 28th, after the celebration service, we will be presenting you with the 2024 spending plan, also known as the budget, uh, the annual report, and the 2024 terms of call for Pastor Jeff. So uh, please attend these meetings, um, ask the questions that you have in these meetings, um, and we look forward to starting the year off wonderfully. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome Reverend Cardi back up and Eulis to give us our closing benediction. Peace and bless the world. And remember, you go nowhere by accident. Where you are going, God is sending you. Where you are, God has placed you. God has a purpose for your life right where you are. Jesus dwells you, has something that he wants you to do in and through your life right where you are. Believe this 
and go in his love and in his grace and in his power. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Yeah, we got it. We brought it back. <laughs> 